Hello everyone. Um, to be honest, I thought at sort of 4.30 on a Saturday there'd be nobody here and I'd be talking to myself. Um, thanks for staying. Um, property management uh, is, is the topic I'm going to be talking to you about. Um, property management is a sec essentially cleaning, security, insurance, uh, accounting, so it, it's not the sexiest topic. Um, so I'll try and keep it light and keep you awake. Um, but it is actually quite important in Cambodia. Um, and why it's important in Cambodia, and perhaps a lot more important here than in Japan or, or Thailand or Singapore, for example, is because of the lack of regulations. Uh, the lack of regulations mean uncertainty. Uncertainty means risk. So risk uh, is, is a big consideration for investors. Um, so knowing what happens downstream, the investors, the, the developers, sorry, can sell you uh, a beautiful condominium, um, but you need to know how it's going to be managed. So um, I'm going to get on to some of that le regulatory framework, um, but I'll first just go through uh, today. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through all the details. I am going to keep it quite light. Um, I'll give you an introduction of who I am, the legal framework, and what, what the practical consideration, what that legal framework then means to the investors, um, the opportunities, the risks, um, and then I'll open it up if anybody does have any questions and answers. So uh, my name is Simon. Um, I've been based in Phnom Penh for six years. Um, formerly I was with CBRE, uh, I ran the property management department there among other projects. Um, I, uh, we managed CBRE, we managed six or seven of the larger buildings in Phnom Penh. Uh, I did in the region of 10 to 15 property management consultancy projects on some of the biggest uh, developers uh, in Phnom Penh. So hopefully I, I know a little bit of what I'm talking about. Um, and now I work for Metro Global, which is a company uh, based uh, out of uh, Singapore, originating from Australia. Uh, and Metro Global, our first two projects will be the bridge and the peak. The bridge is uh, 1.7 million square feet, or 160,000 square meters. Um, so it's a big project, over 2,000 units. Um, and I'm doing the property management. So my head is very much in, in, into all of these property management things at the moment. I'm going through uh, meeting the government sometimes, uh, the developers, uh, to try and sort the landscape of property management out. Um, so the boring stuff first, but we have to cover the boring stuff to really frame the discussion. In terms of the regulatory framework for property management, there's a sub-degree uh, in 2009. This sub-degree, it's good, uh, but it doesn't cover much. I'm happy it's there, but it covers more the use of the co-owned space uh, and that actually uh, co-owners uh, have to pay a service charge, but it, it says very, very little. Um, so just some of the extracts, uh, and there's only a few paragraphs on property management. Uh, in order to manage the co-own building, the co-owners shall establish a management board or an executive committee uh, and follow the prescribed internal regulations. For the co-own building, for the co-own building composed of at least five co-owners, there has to be a, a, a co-own building management organization with an executive committee uh, in charge. How? Did, how, what, when, these are the questions that are unanswered in the regulations. Uh, so what, what, how does this management committee set up? Do the owners all have to start a WhatsApp group, a WeChat group and contact each other? Um, there's a legal cost, I mean, are they gonna run it through a, a property management agent's bank account or when they collect the service charge, where's that money going to go? Um, none of these questions are answered. Um, the only sensible way to do it is to set up a, a legal entity, uh, a single project ent entity, uh, just for the, the management of that building. Uh, and its own separate bank accounts, 
Um, but to do that, you need you need a, a constitution of that company. It, it's a legal company. You have to go to the ministry and form it. You need to know how that company oper operates. Who's going to be the chairman? Who's going to be on the board of directors? What decisions can they make? Can they take a dividend? Can they start putting money in their pocket? None of this is, is covered anywhere in the, le the legislation. So there's huge holes which, in the wrong circumstances, they could severely affect uh, a co-owner, uh, a co-owned building. I mean, um, I'm, I'm fascinated by the Donald Trump and the American uh, election at the moment. Um, you know, so for example, you, you have to vote a chairman uh, in, in charge of this property management company. Imagine this chairman um, sets up, you know, gets, gets the position of chairman and it's for his own self-interest. Uh, and he doesn't really know anything about property management. Um, he's doing it, you know, to benefit himself. This is a situation that can happen in, in many cases. So imagine if this man was the committee chairman. You know, do you feel safe being a co-owner committee? Is he doing it for his own personal benefit? Is you know, what's happening to the money? But there's, there's cases here where, in Cambodia, where companies run away uh, with money. What are the checks to stop that? So th th this is the real worst case scenario. While the subdegree in 2009 helps, it doesn't go far enough. In the end, what it does is it creates a situation that says you have to have a committee, but it doesn't give you anything else, which really opens the door for bad things to happen. I'll go through how, as a, an investor, you can try and prevent those things and take all the cautionary steps that you can. Um, so the Memorandum of uh, Association and Articles of Association, this is the constitution of a property management company. To, to make one of these, you need legal, uh, legal advice, you need expertise. Um, who's gonna pay for that? All, all of these questions are unanswered. So what I'm moving on to now, now I've scared you with Donald Trump and, and the worst case scenario. Um, I'm gonna go on to some of the things that you can, as, as investors, I've invested in a property here. There are ways that you can go about ensuring that you're limiting as much risk as possible. Developers, what developers do upstream affects property management. The best property management company in the world cannot change a poorly developed property. They're just the managing, setting up the operations, the cleaning. So the developer is the first, you know, absolutely look into the developer. Who are they? Are they, uh, do they have a track record? Are they responsible? Are they ethical? Um, not just is the marble in one apartment shinier than, than the other, or gold taps on one and silver on another. Who is who is this developer? What's their reputation? What's their future expectation? You know, what are their future goals? If they're looking to do many, many more projects, they will care about their reputation of their finished projects, which includes property management. Property management budget, PM budget. These should be set up to estimate the service charge, what you're going to pay. Um, so if a developer says you're paying one dollar a square meter, ask the question why? Why am I paying one dollar a square meter service charge? Where is the budget? Where's the plan? Where's all the details? Where's the breakdown? Where's the forecasts? I want to know this. If they haven't done it, and they can't give you satisfactory answers, are we, you know, okay, developers don't always do this at the start. A lot of them do it towards the end. But if they don't have a plan in place at all and they haven't thought about it, this is where you know yellow red flags would you know would start to come up. Developers reputation and the PM agent, if they're using a property management agent, who is this agent? You know, are they a, a listed company that feels quite safe? Are they a reputable company? Um, what, what again as a property management company, look at the ethos and morals and ethics of them. Um, if they're going to be managing um, your your building, because 
as I mentioned with the regulatory framework, there are holes. And a less than reptile agent can do things which would not be in your best interest. Um, watch out for developers. If, if developers uh, are putting themselves as property manager, this is a bit of a red flag. Developers should develop, sell, and then retreat. If the developers are in the whole building, then that's fine. But if it's a co-owned building, um, that's when they really need to be selling and then passing on to, to somebody else because the, the issue with developers uh, also managing properties is the lines get blurred between uh, the service charge income and, and over costs and um, situations can occur where developers start to take money out of a, a building management account. So be careful of that. And actually I would say well, a lot of the buyers I speak to feel really, you know, good. Okay, well, a committee has to set up, so that makes me feel safe. That does the opposite for me. I think committees, without all the regulatory framework, the expertise, uh, the, the legal side of things, in Singapore, there's a very strict process. So you don't actually need to be that much of an expert. You just follow the process. And it's very good, it's very secure, it, it, it provides confidence to buyers. A committee, without somebody in charge with the expertise, without a good constitution for this uh, property management company, uh, the memorandum association, all of these things um, could, could do more, more damage than good, uh, effectively. So if I was in a building, and, and I had a reputable developer, a reputable property managing agent, I personally, even as somebody uh, with experience in doing this, I would rush to get a committee in the first year uh, or first two years, but that, that's just me. Um, internal regulations, these are mentioned in the, the regulatory framework. What a lot of people don't know is when they buy a, uh, a condominium or a property, they get their sales purchase agreement. And they read their sales purchase agreement like it's, uh, you know, it's the gospel, it's, it's the religious truth, and, and okay, so they're reading it. What me and, and then they see these other documents, internal regulations and other things, and think, okay, well, that's, that's not so important. Uh, after you buy your property and you complete the 100% um, sale and transfer, that sales purchase agreement ceases to exist. It's extinguished. That contract is honoured and completed and means nothing in the eyes of the law. The contract that goes forward and should be registered with the ministry here um, is the internal regulations. That is very, very clear. So actually, your sales purchase agreement helps you up to completing the purchase of your property. After that, it's the internal regulations that govern it. So do take note of the internal regulations. They are important. Um, service charge, I mentioned budgets before. How much should it be? Um, you know, I, I meet many people and, and they're outraged if it's more than 50 cents a square meter or, you know, it's, it's $1 a square meter um, without really knowing why, just because they hear that that's what it should be in the market. Do look at the budgets. Um, if you walked into Topaz or a high-class restaurant and put five dollars down and said, "Give me a steak and you know all the vegetables," and they brought you you know a, a McDonald's or a Burger King, you'd be pretty pretty angry. But if you say lower the service charge and then get poor service, well, you get what you pay for effectively. So if you're in a high-class condominium and you want the servicing to be high-class, it's going to be more expensive. If you are just in a very localized development and you want property managers without much experience, accountants without much experience, you can get that, sure, but it, it, you get what you pay for, essentially. So I wouldn't be in a rush just to say, that price is too high, it should be lower. Look into it first. Um, do some homework, try and understand. Or seek somebody else out who does understand. Um, PM company and registration. Um, this is this is nothing you can really worry about, to be honest, uh, and, and I sort of covered it before, but how legally to set up a, a committee. Um, and interestingly, uh, if the, the only rational way to, to manage a building is you set up a single project company, 
the legal state, there's no legal status for that company. It should be a not-for-profit company. So any profit, any uh, reserve money left in the bank account at the end of the year just ticks over to next year. But there's no legal status for that company in Cambodia. So you have to set up a private company and the private company gets charged 20% profit tax. So at the end of the year, if you have anything left in your building, building account, um, you have to pay 20% of it to the government. Um, that is something the government are aware of, um, but I don't know how, how quickly, if at all, they'll get around to changing it. That's, um, that's it. That's what I wanted to cover.